<laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so first off, a question. How many entrepreneurs do we have or aspiring entre entrepreneurs do we have in the audience? Raise your hand if you're a, an aspiring founder or a founder. OK, cool. Hopefully, you'll pick up some tips from, uh, from these unicorn companies. But as we were entering, uh, walking across the stage, you guys were telling me that you don't like the word unicorn. You're not fans of it. You, you kind of hate the terminology. Catherine, why is this? It's something that eight-year-old girls like, and it's a mythical creature. I think there are tons of companies that are worth this much that have earned it over the years. I don't think it has to be magic. Alan, I, you have some thoughts on this know, as well. I, I've been in the, in the tech world for, for a while now. And my problem is that from the inside in that world, when, when people talk about unicorns, uh, my history or observation has been you're talking about companies that have this ridiculous, how could they be worth a billion dollars? You, you're thinking the VCs must be completely insane to put that dollar value on it. And then there's, as was referred in the last, last panel, what, what's the business model in the first place? How do they think they can actually make money, forget, be worth, and support that kind of valuation? So I always look at that term and think about those companies. And so when it gets pointed at my company, I'm sort of shying away. Say, no, 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 it's a different, it's a different thing. Uh, Nick, your company is a very recent entrant to the Unicorn Club. I do like the term. I think it's fun, magical beasts, you know. Uh, do you have a take on this? Uh, I think it's too small, one billion. So that's why I don't like it. I don't are know you, like you pro-unicorn yeah. or yeah. anti-unicorn? Actually, I got a chance. Catherine and I were talking earlier, and we took a vote. We decided we'd all pick on why your company's actually worth a billion dollars. No, sorry. <laughs> oh, get into <laughs> okay. it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I mean, that is something that we can discuss. You recently, I mean, there's been a big crypto mania that's happened uh, over the past year or so. Uh, prices have dropped precipitously in uh, the intervening months, but you guys were riding that wave for quite a bit, uh, adding crypto purchasing capability to your app. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you did that? Well, simply demand from customers. Uh, but reality, crypto is not a large part of our business. I would say it's uh, less than 10% uh, of revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, if customers want you know, to, to buy or sell cryptocurrency, so we, we provide this, uh, this capability to them. Alan, do you have thoughts on cryptocurrency? What, are, what do you think about Bitcoin? Yeah, we were talking about that like, earlier as well. I think the, the biggest value today in, in Bitcoin and crypto is actually putting that in the title of your company because that's going to get you to a billion dollars quicker than actual using it. In have you considered Bitcoin Oscar Health? Uh, not, not Bitcoin. We're, we're looking at blockchain. I've been looking at that and thinking about it for health records, distributed ownership or distributed repositories of, of sensitive content that consumers can, can manage themselves. Uh, but in terms of transactions and money processing and paying claims and the like, I, I, I don't see that, that for, for a long time. Catherine, how about you? Have you considered cryptocurrencies or any of the related technologies over at Cabbage? Our customers aren't asking for the ability to use those currencies. Um, I suspect that's because they're busy running businesses and not thinking much about that. But we thought crypto with a K might be good for us, just cabbage crypto. Um, we are also evaluating the distributed ledger technology because there's a lot of great, whether it's for audit purposes, whether it's for smart contracts, um, whether it's for money transfer, I think there's a lot of great technology that's growing up in and around uh, the crypto ecosystem. Blockchain is also another very hyped word right now. Everybody's looking at that, like you said. Is there actual potential there? Like, what is the hype level versus the real potential use case for this technology? For blockchain. For blockchain, yeah. I think there's tremendous use for it. I, to me, I think that the, it most disintermediates the traditional institutions that are the, the money centers in the world who make a lot of money because they get to sit on it. And so I think the ability to democratize access to the flow of funds, whether it's for um, remittances for people who are sending money to family and um, in other countries, or whether it's simply to um, ease the transfer of funds between institutions, I think there's a huge opportunity for that. And Alan, in actually trying to explore some of this technology and see whether it uh, you know, works as they say it does, what have you experienced? Is this technology where it needs to be yet? Are you waiting? I'm actually not as worried about the specific implementation yet. The implementations are early. Everyone knows about the performance challenges around, around this distributed access. The, the concept I'm more interested in, as Catherine mentioned, is the distributed ledger where it's encrypted, the, user 
the owner of the content gets to maintain or manage access to it, and there's no specific owner. Uh, we're, we're in the healthcare world today, and we're actually an insurer, and there's this tug of war over data ownership that's pervasive in, in our industry. The, the hospital systems, the doctors, uh, doctor's offices, the EMR vendors want to own the content around a consumer. The insurance company have a lot of information around them from claims and so forth. We need to be able to tie all of this together so that any interested party that is supposed to get access can get access to that entire set of content without it being siloed and, and controlled by, by individuals. And I think a distributed ledger has a lot of potential there. Whether it's a blockchain as the actual implementation, I, I'm not worried about that part yet. I don't want to make this talk all about crypto, but how many cryptocurrency owners are there in the audience who, who actually holds on to this stuff? There are quite a number, so all right, we're not going too far afield uh, in terms of our audience interest. Um, Nick, one thing that I found very interesting is that you can buy crypto through your app, but you can't exchange it. You can't you know, put it anywhere. Um, you kind of just have to hold on to it on your phone. And that seems to contradict the idea of this sort of like, you know, free-flowing digital money without borders. Um, why is yeah, that? Yeah, it's uh, thanks to money laundering regulations, right? <laughs> so that's uh, the answer. I mean, the reality is, uh, so uh, right now banks, they uh, can't really see the origin of funds. If, if funds are being uh, uploaded to account um, from, you know, with crypto, right? As a result of it, it's extremely high risk in flow. And as a result of it, because all banks and all schemes, they work in effect in partnership. So banks uh, are not allowing it to do it. And then uh, we, we, we can't do it as well because we are part of, their, of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk a little bit about where each of your companies came from. Uh, where did the idea come from? You know, we can start with you. Uh, sure. It's so, a very new company. It's only three years old. Yeah, so it, it was launched uh, three years ago. Uh, and the idea was simple. So I was an uh, expat uh, living in London, uh, so with a bank account in HSBC, and I was always, always you know, hating HSBC, uh, hating you know, bank fees they charged for every transaction. And you know, I tried to open you know, uh, multiple accounts in HSBC, one in dollar, one in euro. It was a hassle. I always you know, lost passwords for it. And then I thought, OK, I, I need something you know, very slick and simple. Uh, I look in the market, and then uh, uh, there was no product that uh, I, I needed, effectively, and then I created effectively account plus account, uh, which allowed you to spend and send uh, money for free anywhere in the world, right? Uh, and then uh, with time, we, we added more banking products, like credit, insurance, cryptocurrency, business accounts. So we became uh, like effectively digital bank, uh, but targeting a uh, global audience. So basically, you were trying to avoid these fees that accrue anytime you take money out in another country. Yeah, exactly. The initial idea was just you know, to avoid fees. Uh, and later, this idea transformed into uh, global financial services companies, which, uh, which, which provide you all financial uh, services and products that you need through one simple interface. You brought up regulators, and you brought up London. How is Brexit going to affect your operations? Uh, I hope positively, but we'll see. Uh, reality is, uh, so far, I haven't seen any changes, right? So we, we, we we're still able to bring talent to London from, from other countries. Funding is still there, so a lot of VCs are, uh, are ready to invest. So far, I haven't seen any changes. So the only uh, thing that we had to do was to apply for a few licenses in Europe. But again, it just, you know, it's, it's not that uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. Catherine, let's talk about the origins of Cabbage. Um, as I understand, it originally was originating loans for eBay sellers. Is that right? That's right. How did you go from, where did that idea come from? And how did you go from there to where you are now? My co-founder, Rob, had the idea for Cabbage. He was working with this eBay, eBay API they had launched recently. And this is, you know, over 10 years ago. And thought, wow, that's really interesting, rich seller and transaction level data. I wonder if you could use that to make a loan to an eBay seller, a business selling on eBay. And he called me up. My background was in FinTech, though it wasn't called that at the time. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. Consumer lending has been automated since the 90s. Why wouldn't you automate a small business loan? And it turns out nobody else was doing it at the time. Um, and still, many, most aren't. So we quickly expanded um, outside of eBay and Amazon and all the e-commerce platforms. Today, e-commerce probably represents 
represents 10% um, of our customer population. But we stayed really focused on the user experience of getting access to capital in less than 10 minutes and real-time access to third-party data that we use to make these decisions and to which we stay connected for ongoing access to customer performance. If that's only 10%, if e-commerce is only 10%, what is the other fraction of the pie? What's the other 90% who's seeking loans in your platform? Everybody. I mean, everything from medical practices to construction companies to restaurants and retailers and lawn care businesses, um, you name it. We have almost every kind of business on the planet. Alan, so you were not there at the beginning of the founding of Oscar, but you did decide to join. Um, I'm from America where the healthcare system is profoundly broken. It's, <laughs> you know, it's very expensive. Uh, the outcomes are not uh, commensurate with the level of spend. What makes you think that Oscar can come into this established industry and shake it up and fix it with new tech? Well, the uh, company was founded by, by Mario Schlosser and, and uh, Josh Kushner from Thrive, Thrive Capital. And they, they started it about six years ago. And they, they began it with a recognition, that, as you say, the healthcare world in the United States is busted from everything from understanding claims to figuring out what insurance you actually need and how that's going to work for you financially to f finding a doctor and understanding what you need to do about scheduling and, and follow up and the like. And they looked at this whole industry looking at tremendous amount of money flowing through it and tremendously inefficient. The entire space is using 20 to 40 year old technology for transaction processing and a lot of the, the machinery in, in doctor's offices. And they, they basically came at it. This is tremendously broken, but technology can be a foundational piece in fixing it. And so they wanted to start up a high-tech company that would sit at this nexus. It would, we would play the role of the insurance company and process claims and all of that. But we'd change the model for how the insurer interacts with, with the rest of the system. First, with the consumers, when you think about how you interact with your, your health insurance company today, you, you find health, in, health insurance, usually through your employer, and you sign up for it, and then you don't hear from them again until something has happened. You've been to the doctor and you've got claims coming out of the back end, and you don't understand the paperwork they're throwing at you. You don't understand why it costs as much as it does, what your share is, and the insurance company, in fact, has not been pulled into what happened with your episode of care you're going to the doctor until well after the fact. So the, the traditional insurer has no knob to turn or pressure on that system other than what they do with those claims. And in particular, making it very painful for you to get your money or get your coverage and, and so forth. And they looked at that system and said, this is broken. If we change the role of the insurer, instead of just being the, the payer off the back end and handling the money, to being the consumer's guide through the healthcare system you can change their whole dynamic and interaction with all parts of that system, and you get much earlier information about what's going on with your members and all that. So that's where the idea came from, that change the consumer experience around dealing with all aspects of, of getting health care, from finding insurance to finding a doctor to making appointments to dealing up with follow-up care and the finances that come afterwards. If you get in the middle of that and you approach it with a customer-centric viewpoint, you can change the way that whole ecosystem works. So that's, that's really how they, they started all of this. I got attracted to it. The company was three years old when, when I started. Uh, I was at Google for 12 years. I've been in the middle of, of the technology space for a long time. And I was looking for something uh, in a space that I thought really meant something. And for me, education and healthcare are the kind of two domains of interest. And one in which Technology, I think, can make a huge difference in, in how it operates and, and transforming the way, it, the way it works. And Oscar was the right opportunity at the right stage, really starting to grow very quickly, um, desperately needing someone to come in and help grow the technology side of the company and, and the right starting people in, on, the, on the team. One of the many projects you took on at Google involved healthcare, uh, and it wasn't exactly a success. Maybe you can talk a little a bit disaster. about that. It was a disaster. Disaster, okay. I didn't want to say not, it. not quite a disaster. This is back in, in 2007, 2008. We started up Google Health. And Google Health, again, was around personal health records and the desire to set up a system where the consumer owns their own data and they can control who can get at it and how. The problem with 
that start was that Google, where well, there are two problems. One was timing, all the legislation around free ac freer access to medical records throughout that ecosystem had not been passed yet. So there were still these strong silos. But the other thing is that Google was operating from outside the healthcare system on the, on the, on the consumer's behalf, but they did not have direct ties to the hospitals and to the, the pharmaceutical companies and, and labs and, and all of that. And they had to work on partnerships to, to close those loops so they could pull the data in. And doing that from outside the healthcare industry is an enormously daunting task. It's very slow, was not growing at the hockey stick rate that Google looks for and, and expects out of, out of uh, the ventures that it, it goes after. So it, we tried that a couple of years and then decided, oh, we're better off putting resources elsewhere and, and tackling other parts. But I've, I still have this desire to build out that system where this, this, these records are longitudinal. You have them for your entire life, not just while you're with this hospital or with this doctor and you get to control who can get at it and, and curate, curate that content. And actually very recently, Alphabet has plunked down 300 or so million dollars uh, into Oscar. Yep. So there's this nice sort of confluence of events there. Yeah, that, that's been a huge uh, infusion and, and really a validation point for where, we, where we're at today. Uh, Alphabet has huge coffers. They get to look around the industry and and really survey everything that's going on. And they look at spaces that are big, like healthcare, and then they look for companies that they identify as, as real innovators and have a potential to really, really change the way those, those worlds work. And the fact that they placed a bet on, on Oscar is a huge uh, confirming validation point for us internally. Uh, Oscar seems very heavily invested in sort of the US healthcare system. Are there international ambitions for the company? Uh, not for the foreseeable. Uh, I'm a platform guy. So all of the technology that we're building out could be used across a variety of markets and, and geographies. But we're really focused on building our business in the United States. Uh, we're actually in the middle of open enrollment right now. The in insurance market, the individual insurance market in the United States goes by step functions. You get all of your new membership in November, December, and then you're flat for the year, and then you go up. And so we're all in the uh, recruiting new members for 2019. Right now, we, you've reminded we me. I have, have to pick a, my healthcare plan for the next year. Yeah, Thank but you. We, curr we currently have about a quarter million active members across six states and nine nine markets. How many people from the U.S. do we have in the audience? You can raise your hand. Not that many. How many Ooh. people from Europe? Oh yeah, lots from Europe. Well, sorry, this next okay. question's not for It'll you. It'll be a while. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, your company is expanding overseas into North America. Uh, why are you picking that market to go after, and what are you doing to, you know, make an entree? I mean, our, our philosophy is uh, a bit different, right? So we want to usually grab as much as possible, uh, because we are building uh, a global bank, a uh, global company. Then it makes sense, you know, to expand in as many countries as we can uh, support, which is U.S., Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Japan, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by actually expanding in you know, many countries, we allow effectively instant uh, money transfers you know, between these countries. So you don't really need to use a blockchain or like, you know, some money transfer companies because, uh, I mean, account holders in, uh, effectively in Revolut, they, they'll be able to send money to each other instantly for free. FinTech is often this battle between, you know, whether an upstart can get enough customers to really have, uh, have a, a base to work off of versus an incumbent, you know, firing up some product and then uh, using their distribution that they have to, you know, squash the competitor. Um, how are you planning to keep ahead and, and build this challenger bank that actually takes on these giant financial institutions? I mean, we, we don't plan, we do usually, right? And uh, we, we uh, so far do it well in terms of you know, grabbing uh, market from banks. So right now we're opening uh, eight to 10,000 uh, new accounts every day, uh, bank accounts just in Europe. So expected to double, triple when we go outside. Uh, and the solution is very simple, right? We, we produce uh, 10 times better product, 10 times cheaper, right? And then uh, we, we don't market it as well, right? So it's all by word of mouth. So just have better tech. Yeah, uh, tech, yes, plus uh, more automation, I would say, which would uh, allow, which allow us to uh, keep prices, you know, 10x cheaper compared to banks. Uh, Catherine, Cabbage has recently said that it's going to get into payment services, which is territory that's been claimed by PayPal and companies like Square. Um, how are you planning to go up against these other companies? 
From our perspective, we're already serving 160,000 small businesses in the U.S., and um, they're small businesses. The 18 um, million of the 26 million small businesses are generating under a million dollars a year in revenue. So um, this is in the U.S. So for us, it's a very important population, and we already have a great relationship with them where they're sharing data with us in real time um, on an ongoing basis about their business. And we have a relationship because we give them a line of credit. And from our perspective and from at, at their request, they're looking for more products and services they can use that make it easier. Today, they have to go to 10 different vendors, partners, whatever you want to call them, to manage their finances. And we're trying to reduce that number so that ultimately it's only one, which is cabbage. And the next step for us is payments. But there are many more steps beyond that where we can consolidate small business owners' activities so when they want to manage cash flow, they only have to look in one place. Mm -hmm. Nick, actually to return to uh, some of the competitors that you're facing, now that you're entering the U.S., there's a company there that's gotten a lot of attention, Robinhood, and they do uh, fee-less uh, stock trading. Now, this is one of the features that Revolut's pursuing, and so how are you planning on uh, going up against a company that's also attracted a lot of attention doing that specific thing? Uh, I think our big advantage uh, compared to any competitors, so we are involved in uh, multiple products, right? So we effectively issue credit, uh, we do crypto, we do insurance, we do banking. We will start doing trading as well, uh, commission-free stock trading, right? By offering, you know, majority of these products are either free or some, you know, discount. It's a bit finished, you know, much, much better business model compared to just, you know, having commission-free trading, right? Because then you are very vulnerable to competition like us. If we get in the market and then, you know, do the same as Robin Hood does, uh, but, you know, do it for the same price for free, but maybe offer you know, some, some, some more services as well for free. What obstacles are you facing, if any, um, especially as you enter this new market? Uh, in, the US, in the US particular, obviously a regulation, right? So we need to make sure that everything is set up properly. So right now we partnered with uh, one of the banks and then plan to launch it uh, earlier uh, next year. Um, and then, you know, with time get our own license as well. Uh, you've actually had some issues with compliance in the past. You've reported money laundering uh, issues to regulators in the UK. Um, how are you dealing with those issues now? Uh, I mean, in reality, we never had like issues with compliance. It's more like we, as financial institution, are uh, obliged to report any suspicious transactions on our platform, and then we do it uh, effectively every day, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not an issue. It's uh, business as usual. Is it a challenge balancing these sort of like hyper growth versus trying to comply with all these regulations that are uh, have been around for you know decades and decades? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, I would say we approach it uh, a bit differently compared to other companies, right? So we invested heavily in tech, right, and in technologies to actually tackle uh, compliance problems, right? So if you look at banks, uh, they employ probably five to ten thousand. Uh, compliance analysts who look at transactions, look at exception handling, money laundering, and so on. We employ, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 data scientists who uh, build models, algos, to look at transactions in an automated way. So this way, we actually uh, can scale the company you know, much faster. We don't need to employ, you know, five, five to 10,000 uh, people in compliance. Uh, and then actually provide a better product experience to your user. Catherine, same question to you about obstacles. What, what challenges are you facing in growing cabbage? I, a lot of it is about people, I think. You know, over time, you know, as you grow, you have to hire people across the board, whether it's your executive management team or whether it's people in customer service. I think the biggest challenge is making sure that you are hiring the right people, that they share your values and ideals, and they're able to be great stewards of that culture for the people that they hire. And so over time, I think we've developed a pretty good process for doing that. We're right around 500 people right now. I know Oscar's uh, twice our size, and I don't know how big you guys are. But I, to us, that's our biggest challenge. And I think it's because it's so important to us that we want to get it right. And it's so important to us because at the end of the day, every person leads to a customer, and we want to make sure that they have the exact experience that we want them to have. And Alan, same to you. Challenges or obstacles that Oscar is facing? Uh, point about people is, is absolutely spot on. It's very easy to sort of establish and maintain culture in your, in your startup when it's 15 of you in a room all around a big table and you've all mission driven and you've got this common ideal. Everybody knows what everybody's working on. You're all there for the same reason. When you get to 500 
or to we just crossed a thousand a thousand employees maintaining that same feel the same sort of internal environment and connectivity managing how you how you doing communications internally and above all finding the right people to add add to the team is a huge huge challenge in the tech industry there's such tremendous competition for people right now particularly if you're looking for really sharp people that are that are wanting to do something something different they're the hardest to to steal away from someone else and to and to hold on there's tremendous demand for them and that all comes back to how you're how you're sourcing them how you're screening people to bring in in the first place but then what you're doing with culture inside your company to to make it a place that they love love working in so we've got just a couple of minutes left i'd like to end off with maybe some tips or advice for other entrepreneurs um, and you know this can springboard off of the uh, challenges question, or you can take it in another direction. But Alan, we can start with you. Okay, I'll I'll tie back to your your competition uh, question there. Going into some space that's large, you're either trying to do something greenfield, and then whether it catches or not is this big, to my mind, a big coin flip. But if you're going in as a disruptor, there's an existing world and ecosystem out there you're trying to help drive change in. And you're always going to find some parties in that, in that system that understand it's broken and it needs to change, and others that are defensive and holding on like hell to their old model and trying to prevent you from getting in. So focusing on finding like-minded people in that space that want to drive a change and that you can partner with is a huge factor in whether you can actually go in and, and disrupt something new. Second quick pitch for VCs, I've got very mixed emotions about them. I had a horrible early stage experience many years ago. The investors we've got are tremendous. Finding investors with a, a long-term view that understand that it's going to be bumpy and will give you the runway to, to do what you want to do is, is absolutely essential to, to going big. So find change agents and true believers. Um, maybe we can go just 30 seconds apiece. Nick, we can start with you. Tips or advice for other entrepreneurs? Uh, well, I have a few. So I think, you know, number one, you need to be uh, hyper logical in everything what you do, right? So no rose glasses. Uh, it's uh, everything what you do is like a bets, uh, small bets that you do every day. And then, you know, hopefully if you have an uh, advantage, you will win in the end. Number two is uh, you really need to surround yourself with uh, the best people. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, the hardest part. And then uh, number three, you just really need to work hard, work long, work smart, and uh, simple as that. Work hard and smart. All right. Catherine. Uh, there's never a good time to get sick, go on a vacation, have a baby, or start a company. But if you have a really great idea and you think it could be game-changing, then it's important just to do it. But you can't do it part-time. You can't do it in the middle of the night. You can't do it while you have another job. You have to take a risk and you have to invest everything you have, time anyway, um, and try to make it work. And my other advice is find a partner. I think it's really hard to do it on your own. A lot of people do it, but I think it's a lot easier if you have someone with whom you can share the journey. Oh, yeah, and put Bitcoin in the name of your... And oh, that's a good Bitcoin point. Number three, name. Bitcoin. Excellent. Well, that's all we have time for. Let's have a hand for our unicorns up here. Sorry. You're going to be unicorns today. <laughs> all right. Thank you.